And again, uh, exactly what you guys did, we want to make sure that if, if we're going to get time in between sessions um, to talk to each other, to make contact, um, and to talk about data and what you're doing with that, I'm going to turn things over to Brazil and to Daryl. Um, the next thing. Hi, guys. Hi, remember me, Miss Me? Um, so I'm good. Uh, it's a pleasure here to introduce our uh, first uh, panel, full panel, uh, with three speakers uh, on the subject of Brazil. So we'll start out with my colleague and friend, Rochelle. She is right here, sorry, Kayla Greenberg from Universidade Federal do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, UNRIO. She'll be talking about Passados Presentes, a database on the site of memory of slavery in Brazil. She'll be followed by Kristen Mann from Emory University who's working with Urano Andrade and São Bento da Bahia, talking about the database of Alcovina, the Freedom Papers, from the South of the Bahia, 1849-1852, and reflections of how it's been used to study the lives of African slaves and African people. And then following that, other friend, colleague, Carrie Zimmerman from the University of St. Thomas. <laughs> University of St. Thomas. Yeah. You know, I've been informed that the podium is mics. So again, I made the mistake, you have to stand at the podium when you talk. You can move a little. All right. Uh, all right. So you all heard. I hope. I know it wasn't live. It wasn't captured, uh, recorded. But I hope you heard uh, some of these uh, introductions. I want to complete the introduction with Carrie Zimmerman, University of Saint Thomas, who will be talking about advertising gender slave database, Escravos de Ganho in Rio de Janeiro, 1850 to 1880. Ethan will be keeping time, but I will help moderate um, the questions and conversation that we have. So please, Kayla. Hi everyone, thanks to the organizers to have me here. I, you told us not to thank you, so I hope to have the opportunity to thank you in person and I will go straight to my presentation. Um, I, sorry. I'm going to present um, a digital project that is also a public history project called Passados Presentes, uh, Memory of Slavery in Brazil that I'm developing with two colleagues, Abby Matos and Marta Brill from um, Universidade Federal Fluminense. And this is a, this is a project that comprises a database, um, three exhibits, and four apps for cell phones <coughs> that you, are, um, you can download from our, from our uh, website. It is bilingual. And instead of, I wanted to, I wanted you to have a sense of what our project looks like before I talk about our databases, so I would just let um, the main <laughs> characters um, talk for a um, few minutes out of my cell. de africanos escravizados para os américas é considerado pela ONU como um crime contra a humanidade. O Estado brasileiro, mais de 1822, teve responsabilidade direta nesse processo. Dos horrores da travessia, a violência da escravização em terras brasileiras. Apesar disso, a presença africana no Brasil deixou um legado cultural inestimável. Hoje, oficialmente, reconhecido em diversos partidos do nosso país, entre os quais o João com o objetivo de reconhecer essas histórias e estimular o turismo de memória do Rio de Janeiro, o projeto Passados Presentes, Memória da Escravidão do Brasil, em parceria com as comunidades, está construindo exposições permanentes no quilombo do Brasil, no quilombo de São José da Serra e na cidade de Pinheiral. A sinalização turística e os memoriais a céu aberto buscam honrar as vítimas da tragédia, da escravização e celebrar o patrimônio cultural negro e a simples brasileiro Essas são as ruínas da fazenda São José do Pinheiro. Foi uma bosta da fazenda de café na época do Brasil 
sorry, it's the video. The video is supposed to stop. Okay. So um, there is a lot we can talk about this project that has an educational side. And please feel free to browse around if you want. But what I really want to share with you is the databases that lay behind that project, which started as this inventory of um, sites of memory um, with 100 sites of memory in Brazil. And you can imagine how hard it was. And it was a collaborative project to start doing this. And I didn't participate in, this, in that, um, in that part, um, but what we did later was turning this uh, first 100 places in a databases, which is available in our Passados Presentes um, website, and try to do um, a collective work that uh, <coughs> relates data of places of sites of memory that has actually a meaning, um, a meaning, they are actually meaningful to the communities that live there nowadays, to the archival documents, and to the oral history sources that we have available. So the result is um, that databases, which you can search by category, and the categories are capoeira, resistance, Festival, which was our way to translate Paris, but maybe not the best translation. <laughs> Institutions, Jongo, Quilombo, Labor, and Slave Trade. You can also search by um, state in Brazil, by cities in Brazil, and there is an open search by name or anything. <coughs> this is a, still a work in progress, and what if you, like say, Valongo Wharf, which is mm, probably the most fa famous now, what we have is uh, pictures, images, pictures that we took ourselves, and images that are archival collected, a description of the place, um, references, and in some cases we have um, citations and references from different documents. Um, there are two ways in which you can visualize that, and this is becoming more important for us over time. One is in the categories, and the other one is uh, through the Google Maps, which was the simplest uh, technology that we find um, to use, and uh, that's a discussion that I wanna keep up later, w whether a simple and free platform can play an important role when we gather lots of people to work with. So here you can, let's say, if we, go, we have most of our places, sites, are in the southeast, in the state of Rio, but we have partners in Paraná, we have partners in Pernambuco, we have partners in Bahia that we're hoping to uh, put their data on pretty soon. So if we, if you press on one, let's say, the Porto de Jaguarão, the port of Jaguarão, then you have um, information about that. And then you scroll up, <coughs> and you go, let's say, to another one, to Tocantins. So um, I, I would like just to highlight, as I don't, we don't have much time to discuss it, it's um, some of our challenges and also practical challenges on keeping these databases, which is first is how to um, have funding for that, but especially how we can make this uh, live, but also how can we make this meaningful to the communities that we are working with. So this is really something that we're trying to connect the oral history sources and the archival documents with the communities that are <coughs> giving us their data, but also that they should somehow, and I'm using a, a difficult word, but profit from that. So that's why we developed the, the apps. So the apps are ways in which this data is available for these communities, and they choose which data they wanna make public and which data is not public. 
So there are lots of things behind in our system that are not public, and we have an ongoing discussing about that. The other that maybe it's, could be interesting for, for that crowd would be how can we actually think about after a first generation of databases that just focus on numbers, <coughs> now we're focusing on individuals and names. How can we put together databases that focus on individuals and names with databases like this one that I would love to connect with other sites of memory throughout the world that actually give meaning to places? So is there a way to connect places and people? <coughs> I believe there is, but, but it's, it's, a, it's also a, a big <coughs> challenge. So right now, we are trying to overcome our technology problems at the same time that we are um, also trying to think um, as the sites of memory, as a way for people to learn history, general public to learn history, but also for our colleagues to think about links that we didn't think before. But mostly, and maybe that, and that's why our project is called Passados Presentes, Presents Past. We think of those, of that kind of databases that is, that it has a, a site <laughs> as the main thing, as a major place where you can bring the past into the present. And that is becoming very, very meaningful to the ways in which the memory of slavery um, is crucial to our um, role as intellectuals in Brazil nowadays, and also to our um, <coughs> academic researchers as well. <coughs> so I still have 23 seconds, but I'm done. <laughs> 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 is yes on the website is passauspresentes.com.br Thanks to the organizers, thanks to the Mellon Foundation for funding. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about a database of Alforia's Freedom Papers from Salvador Bahia that were registered by notaries between 1829 and 1852. At the end, I'll share some all too brief reflections on how the database can be used to study the lives of African slaves and freed people. I developed this database collaboratively with Urano Andrade. Uh, without his enormous contributions, it wouldn't exist. Meet Urano Andrade. He's a freelance researcher based in Salvador, Bahia. Uh, he, um, specializes in research and the digitization and preservation of documentary collections on colonial Brazil, the history of slavery, and the history of Afro-Brazilian populations. He was the technical coordinator in a major project carried out by Arquivo Público do Estado do Bahia, uh, APEBE, the Federal University of Bahia, UFBA, and the Fundação Pedro Calman in Salvador to digitize all of the Livro de Notas um, in um, uh, APEBE from uh, 1664 to 1889. The project was uh, funded by the British Library's Endangered Archives Initiative. Orano is the author of a blog, Pesquisando a Historia, I commend it to you. Now let me introduce the database. And I need to go from here. All right, come on. Okay, Daniel, here's where I'm gonna need you. Just need to minimize this, and I don't know why it's not working. I just, I well, I'll tell to? you what, we don't even need to do that. Here we go, this should work. All right, thanks, we got it. Daniel's got my back, if anything goes wrong. 
Okay, the database. What you see here is, of course, an Excel spreadsheet into which we have uh, entered in rows uh, information from all of the Cartes de Libertadio, Cartes de Aforio, in all of the volumes of Livros de Notas in Epebe from 1830 to 1850, because some of the volumes for 1830 contain documents that were registered in 1829. We've gone ahead and incorporated those. Similarly, some of the documents <laughs> Uh, of the volumes of the 1850s continue into 1851, 1852, so we have incorporated um, um, those records as well. If I toggle down to the end of the database, you'd see we have 10,100 entries uh, on that many manumissions. In um, columns, we um, introduced, uh, oh, excuse me, we entered uh, information, the name of the slaves, the name of the owner or owners freeing the slaves, the Nassau or information of the document at the origins uh, of the slave, um, the volume of the Livro, the pages in the Livro, because all of these documents have now been digitized, when the digitized version is made available to the public, it'll be very easy to go from the database to the record from which the entry in it was derived. Uh, we've entered information on the date of manumission, which was often different than the date when the document was registered by a notary. Many uh, manumissions, of course, uh, 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 occurred gratis, but uh, when money <coughs> changed hands, we'd entered the amount that uh, was paid for the slave's manumission. Many manumissions had conditions attached to them. Uh, we have entered information in the documents on the condition. Then over here, uh, at the far side, um, we have a, doc, uh, a, a column we simply call uh, observations. The, the documents contain diverse but often very revealing information about individual slaves. Um, you'll see in the first case, uh, the document tells us that uh, the, the child was being freed, 13-year-old girl. Uh, she was the daughter of the slave Claudiana J.J. Uh, you toggle down a little bit, you see there's a, 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 another bit of information, a female slave who's, who was freed um, uh, by giving another female slave in return for her liberty. Now, I'll say more about um, these... Um, Um, categories in a minute, these variables in a minute. Okay. I want to tell you a bit about the origins of the project because it explains the shape that the database takes. I went to Bahia in 2012 to do research um, for a, a book called Transatlantic Lives, Slavery and Freedom in West Africa in Brazil, which investigates the lives of a number of Yoruba speakers enslaved in the wars following uh, the fall of the Oyo Empire. A number of them were sold to Bahia, so I went uh, across the Atlantic to see if I could find them in slavery uh, in Brazil. Ora, I had the great good fortune to employ Orano uh, uh, Draje part-time as a research assistant. We spent a fair amount of time in a pay base turning pages in Libros to Notas, looking for the Cartes de Alforia of my particular subjects. When Odano did that work for me, he started creating Excel spreadsheets of the volumes that he worked through so I could look at them at the end of the day or the week and see if there was anybody there of interest to me. After I came back to the United States, Odano continued that work on my behalf. Before long, we had uh, about 30 volumes of Libros de Notas uh, entered into our database, and there were about 45 uh, hundred uh, many missions um, included. Uh, at the time I went to work in Brazil, about 29 of the volumes of the period of special interest to me uh, were classified as fora da uso, that's to say they were in such perilous condition that scholars couldn't look at them. Thanks to the digitization project, those um, volumes became available to us, and Orano and I decided we'd go ahead and enter the, uh, car those, those cartas uh, into the database. Here you see just uh, examples of a couple of um, uh, the, uh, the documents, uh, the sorts of documents that we work uh, with. I only have time to really to talk about one. It's uh, on your uh, right. Um, it is the uh, Carta de Liberdade of a Preto Francisco Gomez de Nassau Nago, uh, who was freed in Ajuda on the West African coast in 1836. Interestingly, he paid 300 pesos for his uh, freedom. He was owned by a man named um, Jose Ignacio de Costa Almeida, who was a small-time trader who traveled between Bahia and Sao uh, Tome, 
from Esqualet to Costa de Mina. The stopovers on the Costa de Mina. Then in the 1840s, he lived in Lagos where he worked as a small time slave trader, sending two or three slaves at a time both back to Bahia and also to Cuba. Um, I'm trying to figure out if this is the um, freedom paper of one of my primary subjects who often went by the name Francisco Gomez Tiendraje, but also used the name Francisco Gomez, my subject, as a slave, traveled back and forth working in the slave trade from Bahia to Lagos. He continued to work in the slave trade on the West African coast as a freedman. He may have traveled to Cuba. Um, he may have been on a ship that was um, um, uh, adjudicated in Sierra Leone and uh, spent uh, some time in Freetown. Uh, matching names, this whole question of disaggregation and telling and, and determining that two names are really the same people is uh, a, a complex process. I'd like to think this is the freedom paper of my subject, but I'm not yet 100% sure. Okay, um, I've already talked to you about Libertos, we have about, about 10,100. Um, uh, notaries from all parishes in Salvador kept these libros de notas uh, so that the, especially at least where Salvador is concerned, the doc of the date are pretty uh, uh, representative. Uh, the notaries also represent uh, re registered um, uh, cartas from other parts of Brazil and indeed as you saw in Francisco Gomez, there's um, a case from beyond Brazil. I can't tell you how many senores are represented in the database because certain names were very common. They uh, uh, appear in considerable number in the database. Sometimes you can tell from information in the Carta de Liberdade that a senor with the same name is freeing several different slaves is in fact the same individual, but you can't always tell that. Sometimes you have to do research beyond the Carta de Liberdade to try to make that determination. Senores of interest to me, I've done that work, but there are many senores in here where, I, of course, I haven't had the opportunity or the time to, to do that. Nassau, we have information <laughs> on nine-tenths of the cases. Lisa Earl Castillo, a wonderful friend and collaborator and researcher, uh, analyzed a, 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 um, an earlier version of this database a year ago when we had about 700 fewer cases in it than we do now. Um, uh, working with the information on Nassau, she concluded that 53% uh, of the slaves freed were Afri African born and 47% were um, Brazilian born. Um, she. Um, uh, then analyze the particular nascents of the African-born slaves and um, organize them by region and concluded that 10% uh, of the slaves, uh, the African-born slaves who were freed were from Central Africa, 16% were Bay speakers from the Bight of Benin, 46% were Yoruba speakers from the Bight of uh, uh, Benin, and uh, about 20% were either other nascents from the Bight of Benin or from the Bight of Biafra. Preso, uh, we have information on about 39% of the cases. Prices varied from one mil reis uh, uh, to two contos de reis paid in 1847 by an adult male nago who was a very highly skilled metal worker. Um, he uh, is referred to in the, the carta as an ochimo, a great oficio de calderero, a perfecto or perfect serraliero, and a muito bom ferrero, a muito bom ferrero, a very good blacksmith. If anybody knows the exact difference between a calderero and a serraliero, I'd really like to know. I've been trying to figure it out, and I haven't fully uh, satisfied myself. Uh, modal uh, price was 400 mil reis. Uh, here you see information on the mean price uh, for the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and these figures are adjusted using uh, Richard Graham's index of prices and exchange rates for Salvador. The earliest manumission in the database occurred in 1793, but wasn't registered until 1835, which is why it shows up in our database. The latest was registered in um, uh, March uh, 1852. Uh, here you <coughs> see the numbers we have for uh, different decades. Uh, 1830s, about 4,400. 1840s, about uh, 3,900. Um, uh, we picked up almost a thousand from the 1820s because there was often a, ga a lag a uh, 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 between the date of manumission and the date of registration. And then, of course, some volumes we worked through for the 30s contained records um, for the 20s. And we picked up already about 1800, 1800 plus for the 1850s. Condissao, I won't take time to say too much about that. Certain conditions were very common. A company had served the owner or relative of the owner for as long as he, she, they may live after the payment of an additional amount of money, uh, after the celebration of a certain number <coughs> of masses. But sometimes they were also very specific. One a man was freed on the condition that whenever his former owner needed his cadera, 
his uh, chair carried, um, the, the freedman had to do that work. A uh, young uh, female slave was freed on the, uh, with the obligation of marrying her owners. Um, the observed voice are, are dis, uh, varied and, and sometimes quite interesting. Commonly, uh, a slave would be freed in exchange for another slave, um, evidence of slaves in Salvador owning uh, slaves. Um, in another uh, case, um, uh, a, a slave had been bought and a lot of other slaves from a particular individual when she was eight years old. Uh, another one that's referred to as bought in a cargo that had been brought from the coast by a specific uh, trader. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, that sort of information can be very valuable in helping understand both the life of the slave and the process of manumission. Potential uses of the database, well, it could, of course, be used to study manumission. That's not why we created it, and I don't intend to use it that way, but I'd be happy to make it available to anybody who'd like to use it for that purpose. Um, <coughs> We, I created the database to facilitate the study of the lives of individual African slaves and freed people uh, in uh, Salvador and other parts of, of Bahia. And of course, um, the data in the database illuminates the, the moment of manumission, which is a, a pivotal moment in the life of a slave or a freed person and contains all kinds of useful information about uh, manumission. But the, da uh, the, the database also contern uh, includes other information that can open new avenues of inquiry into the lives of slaves and freed people. Simply having the name of the owner can be very helpful. Slaves are, can be very difficult to find, individual slaves very difficult to find in the historical records. Um, Owners are much easier to find, and, and, and if you do research on the owner, sometimes you can illuminate the experiences of um, the slave. If you know the name of the owner at the time of manumission, it's possible to identify earlier owners, and so to document the buying and selling of slaves locally, even sometimes into the intra-Brazilian slave trade uh, by working with passport records where owners are sending groups of slaves who are named in the records elsewhere, usually down to Rio, for sale. Um, and knowing the owner of, uh, knowing the name of the owner facilitates ad identification of the parish or parishes where the slave lived. If you know the parish where the slave lived, it gives you a head start on um, uh, uh, a work through parish records. I've got it. <coughs> two minutes, I've got it. <laughs> no, that's two minutes over. Oh! Well, I didn't know. Well, I'm out of time. You should have told me that. You should have been much more. Uh, all right. So, uh, so that, that with these, um, all I'm going to say is plans and aspirations. We want to finish cleaning the deck at the data, then we want to make it available. Uh, I'm here to learn how best to do that. We don't right now want to develop what we've got into a fancier uh, digital humanities project. We want to invest our time in expanding the database. So we're pushing back into the 1820s, and we want to go all the way back. 1800. There's a search engine in Okay Bay that's much better after 1850 than before 1850. So that's why our focus is going back to 1800 rather than before. I don't have any questions. I'm two minutes over. I'm done. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Thank okay. Presentation is already maybe untitled one. That oh, one. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. And we have a microphone for you. Ugh. I'm really mad. I know, but. <laughs> this is of course a challenge now because it's just gone into war low battery warning, so we're going to. What's that? I can't. Can yeah. Can we give her an opportunity to project or? Yeah. We try. You, if you want, yeah. I just Are you comfortable with that? Like, yeah. Totally. Yeah. We're gonna try projecting. Terry's gonna be uh, <laughs> the sage on the stage. Really loud. <laughs> really loud. But if that doesn't work, if those of you in the back are not here, please raise your hand, and we'll get some technological assistance as well. Yeah. Hopefully, that <laughs> with the battery that is functional. Carrie. Okay. So I'm really loud and I'm really paranoid about the time. So uh, all the emails, you know, freaked me out a little bit. Um, my name is Carrie Zimmerman. I, I also just want to echo a quick thanks because I am indeed one of those people who did this research, created a database 
for one solitary purpose, and then I put it in a drawer. Um, so thinking about ways that um, I can share that data, that I can make it more user friendly. Uh, what I'm going to do is just start by introducing the data and um, telling you a few of the conclusions that putting this information into a data set let me come up with, and then ideas on um, how to move forward. Uh, I sort of call this advertising gender uh, slave database. It classifies uh, information on escravos giganos, or rental slaves, in Rio de Janeiro from 1850 to 1880. As one of the few uh, comprehensive collections of rental slave advertisements in those waning years of slavery, the database really helps us reconceptualize not only what it was like to be a slave in Brazil, but how that experience took shape uh, based on uh, gender. So, like I said, I was paranoid about all this, so I just took a snapshot of my uh, spreadsheet here, of my database. <coughs> I used Excel. Um, quite frankly, when I started this, the uh, advertisements that I were looking at were on microfilm. So, you know, I, I want a little extra credit for all the time I spent in the basement of the Stanford Library in front of those machines. Now, all of these newspapers are largely digitized uh, through the Biblioteca Nacional, so it's, it makes it much more uh, easier to look at and to search, to search by names, to search by individual variables. But my analysis uh, includes about uh, 2,200 rental slave advertisements that were published in the Jornal do Comercio, uh, which was one of the most widely circulated newspapers at the end, second half of uh, the 19th century. And the advertisements themselves uh, occupied anywhere from about one half to two thirds of the newspaper's content. And you'll see that I um, also included, when I originally did this, I included sales, advertisements for slave sales, and advertisements for runaways, which turned into a separate database um, that I'm happy to talk about at another time. But uh, what I did here, or what I want to talk about here, is a sample of the advertisements that I looked at. And uh, I looked at four months of the years 1850, 60, 70, and 80, and I just took like a, you know, a day's worth in each of these four months. Uh, these dates obviously coincide with uh, key moments in the uh, final abolition of slavery in Brazil. The database itself consistently records the sex and the occupations of escravos giganos. And I divided those uh, advertisements into ads that were offering uh, um, that were offering slaves to rent, as well as ads that were looking for slaves to hire. Uh, what else do I want to tell you about this? When available, I also included information on age, information on race, prices, uh, locations of the owner. In some cases, it's clear that it's a, um, a house, right? Like a, a, a rental house or a, a, can't think of the name right now. Um, but I also included a, a category for observations on the occupational training of these escravos giganos, uh, on their character, that's often included in the advertisements, and on their capabilities. So anything that I could sort of cull from these advertisements, I threw into uh, my database. The labor itself was my primary interest. Uh, it turned into a little bit more, but um, this is one of the tables that I, I want to share with you which uh, demonstrate that the degree of multitasking uh, that was expected of female slaves. So when possible, uh, what I did was not just I include any job that was requested or that was offered of an individual slave. So if a female slave, for example, could launder, could starch, and uh, could starch clothing and could also cook, I included all of those in the occupation. And so then I was able to filter them and to look at you know, how many jobs were requested by female slaves, how many were requested uh, by male. And so most of the advertisements, as you can see here, uh, requested women to work a variety of jobs at once, while the majority of men 
were hired for one specific task. Advertising, um, advertisements seeking males for one occupation accounted for more than 65% in each of these periods. But the percentage suggesting that women uh, concentrate on one job barely surpassed one third of all announcements. Previous studies of uh, slave labor in Brazil acknowledge a certain degree of multitasking, but often women are characterized as doing one job. Uh, uh, they're confined to autonomous categories that are based on sex. What I found out is that rates of multitasking point to the difference in how women and men worked, uh, because in fact you might be doing one job if you were a male slave. These rates of multitasking uh, point to not just the difference between how women and men worked, uh, but also gendered expectations of their labor. There's a wide category of uh, jobs included uh, in the advertisements, but it's pretty clear that they deliberately prescribed, or they deliberately reflected, however you want to look at it, uh, a gendered division of labor that followed what many have uh, described Brazilian society in the 19th century as this separate spheres ideology. The advertisements published at this time include 55 different job categories for male slaves, whereas their female counterparts were limited to 33 different types of occupations, and only about two or three of those 33 were outside the realm of domestic labor. And so this was interesting to me uh, for a few reasons, one of which was the lack of opportunities for professionalization for uh, female slaves. Domestic labor was central for all rental slaves. Uh, it was about three quarters of all requests for slave labor. But female slaves were advertised for positions that had a specific connection to the home, both ideologically and literally. Women were hired to cook, to sew, uh, launder, attend the family's children. Uh, and annuncios that would offer these services would um, often describe these slaves as good character for watching their children, um, that they kept the house very well, uh, that they were skilled in all types of household service. But in turn, advertisements for male escravos gigano connected to the domestic or connected to domestic uh, tasks. They would offer males for cooks that could be for a home or also that were suitable for a tavern. Um, or they were described as masters of their skill, right? They were oficial. Uh, in contrast, that woman that I described who was advertised to both launder, to starch clothing, to cook, uh, her one characteristic was that she was a very caring young girl. So probably an important characteristic for loyal service, uh, but not necessarily a reflection of, um, of her skills, right, of her skill set, and of any skill set that she might be able to take with her if in fact uh, she was uh, manumitted. And so my final point out, uh, my final point that I want to show you with this table is that by being able to cross-reference these types of jobs, I not, not only became evident what slaves did or female slaves did on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but how much they contrasted that prescriptive ideology of the separate spheres. Uh, quite frankly, it was impossible to serve as a uh, female slave, to be rented out, and maintain that separate spheres ideology because so many women were requested to launder, right? Something that brought you out of the public sphere. And they were often requested to launder with jobs that were specific to uh, the home, that were considered protected uh, domestic jobs like starching, like cooking, um, sewing, or being uh, a chambermaid. So the advertisements show that dichotomy between cultural expectations and the reality of uh, Brazilian slave society. A female slave could never live up to the expectations of uh, the separate spheres because the prescription of house and street did not meet the demands of their labor. 
So my final point about uh, the findings of the database that are, are very obviously very specific to Brazilian uh, society, but hopefully they could be extended uh, to, uh, for other investigations on both gender as well as urban slavery. Um, for example, urban occupational profiles of female and male slaves, how do they compare in different urban centers? Uh, the degree of multitasking in other urban slave societies and the role of spatial boundaries in slave labor. Um, these descriptions of personal character, <coughs> what they say about urban slave populations, what they say about the perception of their masters, um, and in particular where my interest was is how they create this constructed um, gender norm. And then general aspects of urban slavery, the rental market, um, slave advertisements, sort of frequency, and what sort of detail are included in here. 44 seconds. I told you I was super paranoid about this. Um, but hopefully I, I compensate for a, a little bit of the extra time that my colleague uh, so readily deserved. <laughs> The question is uh, related to the, the utility of the QR codes, which uh, Kayla's uh, project showed in the video, and kind of more broadly, the utility of QR codes for those people interested. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you asked about the QR codes because they are my favorite uh, thing on the app. Because oh, our goal, when you have the app, is truly to make people go to the site and not have all the information you can that we have in the databases in the website. So the, the QR code allows you when, you, when you spot the app, to hear our interviews with the local community. And this especially because they are not always available to guide people there, or because sometimes they're singing jungle songs, and so we're able to hear that. And I think that the QR code is really interesting, it's not just for that, but for um, to make other kinds of information accessible. So I have to say just one thing about that is that sometimes I think people get super um, excited about the use of QR codes that are, for me, it's really annoying, which is when you get, when like you, in the downtown Rio area, in the port area, there's, there's full of QR codes everywhere. But then you, when you look at what they tell you, it's exactly what that website says. So at that kind of, it's a, it's a way, and tech people have already said that to me, that you can, you need some time to create different paths to access the same information. I don't like it. <laughs> I like, uh, what I think is very useful is to link the place with the data, and, and that's a, I think that's a, a very good way to do that. Thank you. Jane. So the, let me, so Chris and I can, do, just so they will capture that. The question is around the category or the uh, column nasson, but also its relationship to other ways to talk about birth, color, race, et cetera, whether they should be separate or conglomerated, uh, agglomerated uh, data, set, data categories. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. And, you Kristen, why don't you come up here so they can capture Kristen? Come, yeah. so you can stand and talk to the oh. audience and also get a recording. Nassau wasn't really a very good label. 
uh, because uh, particularly, I mean, if you look at the Brazilian born, Creole, Creoline, Cabra, uh, Cabra um, uh, uh, you know, Mulata, Mulata, and there's even one case where the woman is just identified as Brasileira. Uh, and, but um, uh, in, in the African case, uh, sometimes Preto, Preto, de Nassau, uh, <coughs> uh, or, or the, a person who's generally from the coast, uh, or uh, lingua geral, speaks the lingua geral language associated with the uh, western slave coast. Um, yes, that data can be disaggregated, and strictly speaking, that sound doesn't really describe uh, the, the, the kinds of, of, of uh, information that's reported there. It does commonly in the case of the Africans. I have a table that breaks down the African Nassois, uh, and they're represented as we usually think of them. So I appreciate that comment. Thank you. One more last question, please. Please identify yourself. Yeah, so the, Terry Brown with the Montpelier Foundation. My question is for you. I'm, I'm super interested in our place and working with communities. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you've been working with local communities um, and the, how to help flush their engagement in the process of building the database. So this question is about the relationship between Kayla's project and working with local communities. So this started actually 20 years ago with my colleagues, um, Abby Matos and Marta Brill. They have started doing oral history, like a, what is now a <coughs> traditional oral history project with many communities, but mainly the one, um, our partners in this project, in uh, the Quilombo of Bracuí, Quilombo of São José da Serra, and uh, the Jongo community of Pinheiral. So they have been partnering in, in previous projects, and basically, I think they developed a very uh, trustable relationship in which uh, they're really working together. Uh, now, when we came up, we talked to them and we asked if they were interested on, um, you know, we, the funding we got, <coughs> we got together. So we really, it's, this, is a, this is a scholarly project in terms of the databases and stuff, but this is a really shared authorship project in terms of the public history thing. So we really decided all the things together. And if you look at the video later, you can see part of the process of how we engage with them. So we talked to them and they, they, they pretty much gave us information about all the places and the whole exhibit was um, curated by them. In a sense that they, I mean, they, you know, one time we forgot to ask uh, about a specific image that we found that we found really cool, so we printed it out. And then Marilda, who is the leader of the community in Baracuí, she said, no way, I mean. And we were like, this costs us a lot of money. And she's like, I'm sorry, just print it again. So we did. And then she explained why, because that specific image was of a plantation of a master that was known as the bad guy. And by then, her memory was of their former master who donated the land to them as a good guy. Now she has a different narrative too. So that's actually something that is really interesting over time is how <coughs> the narratives change. And, and that changes our project too. So it's re in some ways it's complicated because we have to be doing it in a way that we can change our files according to what they wanna say. And we've been doing this um, over time. But, you know, I don't want to take too much of the time, but I, you know, I can certainly talk more about the communities and our relationship. I'll well. take prerogatives. Uh, pr uh, the, the communist prerogative to ask Carrie a question. How do you come up with this, identify escravos giganyu from any other kind of escravo or person who's being rented and services are being rented in can your I, database? Can I jump on that question? Well, let, let, let's Carrie go and then. Yeah, because so. it's the same question. Come up here, Carrie. Yeah. It's just, yeah, one yeah. thing that I, I had this question for you is how you know who controls the process. Because mm -hmm. the you can be self-hired yeah. and can be some slaves for rent. Yeah. And there is this, it, and the historiography really separates yeah. both. So yeah. if you can, you know. Uh, so it's a great question and it's something that I, I, every time I go back to my database, I grapple with, right? And I sort of question myself. Um, but uh, what I tried to do was uh, identify those places that were commission houses that might be you know, just renting out uh, on behalf of others. I, I tried to do it based on the address 
of um, where you would hire the slave from, and you know, uh, uh, you could. There's patterns that you can determine if it's a self-hire or if it's um, someone actually hiring out their labor. Some of it is based on the characteristics like that are included. Sometimes it will say this is a free person. Um, you know, this is this is. If someone is not allowed to go out onto the street, um, often you know you can use some of those characteristics to determine. The ones that I, I felt too uncertain about, I did not include um, in in my database. So it's it's a challenge. I, if anyone else has ever worked with those, I, I welcome. Um, Kayla and I will have to talk over lunch uh, suggestions. But um, I, you know, I sort of tried to use any indication, uh, either characteristic, uh, qualitative, or quantitative, that I could to to determine. Thank you. So thank you all very much. Thank our panel. We're going to take a 10 minute break again. This is an opportunity for you guys to talk and grab some more coffee in the bathroom. If you are in the next session, please come up. We'll get your slides uh, set up and we'll start drawing at 11.50. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly.